Very good. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar, part one of a two-part series on modeling of advanced materials with SimCenter 3D Materials Engineering. This webinar is sponsored by ATA Engineering, and I'll give a brief description of ATA Engineering before turning over the podium to our guest presenter, Hayden Cornwell from Siemens Digital Industries Software. So ATA Engineering is an employee-owned uh, engineering company headquartered in San Diego, California, with about 180 employees, uh, pushing upwards to maybe 200 now as we continue to grow. We have uh, a very experienced staff with an average of 15 years of experience, and we focus on solving the toughest engineering problems for our clients. We serve a number of industries, including aerospace. Uh, we had a very big role in um, some of the detailed engineering on the Mars rover that recently landed. Uh, but we also do other work in the space industry in launch vehicles, rocket engines, satellites, etc. Uh, we also have a growing business in robotics and controls and themed entertainment and other uh, industries such as defense industrial and mining equipment, consumer products, et cetera. We provide service for our customers uh, of complete integrated solutions, including design, analysis, and test from our offices all over the country. Again, the headquarters is in San Diego, California, but we also have offices in Los Angeles, the Bay Area, Denver, Albuquerque, Huntsville, Alabama, and in Washington, DC. One of the other things that ATA Engineering is known for is providing software from Siemens Digital Industries Software. We are a value added reseller, in fact, a platinum level solutions partner for Siemens Digital Industries Software. And we sell and support a wide range of Siemens products that include the one we're going to be looking at today, SimCenter 3D Materials Engineering. The other products we support are NX CAD and CAM, Solid Edge, SimCenter Star CCM Plus. SimCenter FEMAT, SimCenter NASTRAN, Team Center, and actually a variety of other products that aren't listed here. We are the developer of the official SimCenter NASTRAN training materials for Siemens and the preferred North American provider for SimCenter NASTRAN training. We are proud to be recognized as a smart expert partner with validated expertise in FEMAT, Star CCM Plus, and SimCenter 3D. If you'd like more information on us or any of the products that we sell and support, uh, visit us at ata-plmsoftware.com where you would go as a customer to receive support for your products that you purchased from ATA, but where there's also a rich treasure trove of resources, including white papers, presentations, uh, recorded previous webinars, uh, tips and tricks, et cetera, uh, related to Siemens engineering products. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Hayden Cornwell from Siemens Digital Industry Software. Uh, Hayden is technical product manager for the SimCenter 3D materials engineering product at Siemens. He is a graduate of MIT and before joining Siemens with the acquisition of Multimechanics in 2017, had been hired by Multimechanics to work on the very software that we're going to be uh, looking at today. I will now turn things over to Hayden, who's going to be presenting today's materials. Great, thank you for that introduction. I'm switching over to my screen right now. Great, should be switched over. So again, thank you for the introduction and I uh, appreciate being here uh, in partnership with uh, ATA Engineering. Uh, like was said, I'm a technical product manager uh, for materials engineering. I've been working with this tool uh, for almost uh, four years now. So we're first going to go into why this tool came about. Why, why is materials engineering a very important, uh, its own capability, its own subset of capabilities within SimCenter? Uh, and the reason is materials are pretty ubiquitous across all industries. I mean, if you think about it, if you're making a product, it's made out of a material. 
Uh, and if it's made out of material, you're looking to innovate in any way possible. And that can be at the material level. Of course, innovation uh, has been progressing through some industries like aerospace, which is typically more on the cutting edge advanced. And we have materials like composites uh, because of aerospace that have been around for now maybe 40, 30 years. But we have these new industries that are looking to apply these advanced materials and make changes to them to be more suitable for the different performance parameters. And just look at some numbers, we're looking at the uh, impact of new materials uh, over uh, the previous decade and the next few decades, and it's a uh, exponentially increasing trend. So we want to be able to capture that through the also digital twin initiative, where we want to be able to iterate design and simulation uh, virtually. And having materials is basically, uh, it, it's extremely important because we need to tie together all these different types of uh, these type of analyses, because in the end, materials do matter. So looking at the agenda today, we'll first be going over SimCenter 3D Materials Engineering and Multimec uh, as an overview, and also some of the capabilities and what it looks like within the SimCenter software. <laughs> we'll then be going through uh, the applications for aerospace composites, uh, and even uh, even though we go over a few different topics for aerospace composites, we don't cover everything, unfortunately, but um, you know, we, we are going to show some of the more important ones. The applications in additive manufacturing will also go over, and specifically lattice design. Uh, and at the end, we'll go over some topics for our next webinar. We'll go over some other applications in additive manufacturing. And then we'll have a Q&A session to answer any questions you may have. So we're going over a lot today, so hold on. Looking at the traditional structural performance uh, you know, iteration loop, what we have is a start off at the test campaign where we can take a material and put it through an extensive testing campaign, uh, which depending on the complexity of the material can be a subset of tests or a full suite of tests. Once we have that data, we can put it into a material database, which can be used to create material cards for structural simulation. And we put it through our finite element solver and we can judge performance and we can make iterations to the geometry. However, if our material doesn't meet these standards, we have to iterate back down to the material level and do this extensive testing campaign again. Uh, and in the end, if you don't, because it's a linear process, it's, it's very iterative and it can be very costly to explore these micro design variables. So take a closer look at what makes these materials complex and what makes it hard to really tie together the loop. And the answer to that is when we look at a material in bulk on a part level scale, it's actually comprised of a lot of different scales of intricate substructures. In this case, we have a woven composite, which at a meso scale <clears throat> can be on the millimeter level where you have woven toes. And then even below that on the micron scale, you have micro porosity that can lead to damage and material variation. So all performance, and that is failure included, starts at this level and propagates upwards to the goal apart, which defines its performance. And to look and scratch the surface of just how complex these materials can be, we're looking at a few different composite materials here. We have unidirectional, short fiber composites, we have particulate composites, or even porous type of materials. And when we look at just the constituent materials, let's say an in inclusion, we can have different stiffnesses between the matrix and the inclusion. On top of that, you can have nonlinear material properties of the inclusions. Uh, commonly, you have a polymer, which can be plastic, viscoplastic, viscoelastic, or brittle, and everywhere in between, which makes it that much more complex. And then on top of all of this, you have these competing different materials with different material properties you have interfacial properties as well. So do these materials stick to each other? And uh, you know, how, what's the fracture toughness of that and how we measure that? <clears throat> these are all very complex questions and it's very hard to generalize these without looking at this material level through finite element analysis. And on top of just the materials themselves, we have an infinite range of different types of shapes where we have short fiber composites can be different aspect ratios and orientations. We have unidirectional you know, composites, which have different spatial alignments within uh, their, the material. We have porous and particular composites. We have woven, we have maybe even controlled structures like uh, a lattice structure or even random uh, porous structures like foams. 
And instead of modeling all these different details at the global scale, which if you have a meter part with a micron size substructure, it's going to be very, very difficult to model all the different intricacies. So what we propose as a solution is to decouple the finite element mesh and strongly couple the material behavior through what we call true multi-scale modeling. Let's look at an example of what true multi-scale is. We have five different microstructures here pointing to five different parts of this global structure, which is a bar in the middle. <laughs> we'll see as we load this bar, we see how the stresses are different between all the different microstructures because these microstructures are tied to a unique integration point. So the stresses and strains are we pass from the global level to this microstructures. The microstructures are gonna be loaded and depending on if they are failing or not, they're gonna pass back the average stiffness or the homogenized stiffness back to the global scale and do that in a tightly coupled fashion every single time set by every single integration point. So we can see how some areas have higher stress, some have lower stress. When we said the areas of higher stress, we begin to develop some damage. In this case, it's viscoelastic with cracks in the composite. <clears throat> As we begin the loading, we get the reduced stiffness over time. When we reduce the stiffness, you have a greater de deflection. You also have less stresses and these stresses begin to be redirected to the neighboring elements, just like progressive damage. You can imagine a model with microstructure every every single integration point can get computationally expensive and you're correct so in this benchmark model we're going to showcase what we've done through the adaptive multi-scale algorithm so we have three example rvs point different areas one under shear one on tension one on compression and there are fifty thousand of these microstructures running in the background but what we decided to do was reduce our runtime by applying an adaptive algorithm that allows for uh, a, a surrogate type of RBE model to be automatically distributed throughout the part where they need to. So what we get is an initial runtime for this FE squared method at 40 days to come down to 40 minutes. And that's a, 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 a very profound reduction in runtime and it takes a model that used to be basically infeasible for taking any product to market to now being able to iterate it through multiple different design cycles in a single day. And finally, we're talking about multi-scale and I, we gave our representation of multi-scaling through this fully coupled multi-scale analysis. And that is our main primary form of multi-scaling that is a differentiating factor for the materials engineering suite where we uh, fully couple the multi-scale analysis at every single time step so we capture failure as a material is being loaded. <laughs> the other types of multi-scaling that we'll see are homogenization, dehomogenization, or single-scale virtual tests of a microstructure. Homogenization is where you achieve the averaged stiffnesses of a microstructure. Dehomogenization is where you take an element of a global model and you apply the strain history to a microstructure. And you can also run these virtual tests where you can push and pull in unidirectional, bidirectional loads to see how the RVE performs. However, traditionally, this is considered more of a one-way multi-scaling where you can get a, the virtual test of a single model in different directions and you can create a material card and apply that to a multi-scale but it's not updating in real time live. So you're gonna be missing some of the accuracy because you tend to extrapolate between the different load cases. And then other forms of multi-scaling include analytical methods like Mori Tanaka or mean fields. And these were basically take simplified geometries and you can create elastic or uh, non-linear type of material models based off of these. But of course you're losing uh, even more, uh, even more accuracy because you're creating simplified methods that are trying to represent different types of shapes. Within materials engineering, we have this fully coupled multi-scale analysis with adaptive multi-scaling. And we also can still do the homogenization, dehomogenization and virtual tests because that is, that's required for the multi-scale. So it's, it's rather easy to include all of this within the, the materials engineering suite. 
regarding analytical methods, we don't rely too much on these different types of methods, but we do have a lot of constituent material properties that represent the constitutive materials. So in summary, sim center 3D materials engineering is looking to aim to close the loop in product development by actually creating a parameter at the material level instead of treating it as a small design set or something that can't be changed. And because now we can design for our materials that can be tightly integrated together and we can create better products. Next, we're gonna look at the different capabilities within the materials engineering suite. And a logical place to start off at is the microstructure generation tool. And this is a tool that allows for the automatic geometry and mesh creation for a wide range of microstructures. Within the dialog box, you can select different shapes of inclusions, including cylinders, spheres, ellipsoids, irregular, or weaves. You can also change the orientation of the inclusions, uh, create different dimensionality. It can be a 2D or 3D RVE. It can be 1D inclusions where you have bar elements for fibers, as an example. You also have the ability to include voids and change the volume fraction. And this can be done automatically. And you can see from the right how we randomly insert these microstructures because it's important to incorporate the randomness within these structures. Because you can have a consistent volume fraction material, but just the way they're inserted can change the properties uh, from material from point to point. We also have other options to customize and create your own microstructures. And through the powerful uh, CAD capabilities of NX, you can create whatever structure you'd want. You can mesh it out in SimCenter and export it to Multimec to uh, import it into a Multimec model for a microstructural model. We also have uh, an advanced periodic UD fiber microstructure creation tool that allows for a, the same thing we could do in the automatic microstructure generator, but it's a much more complex uh, type of microstructure that was for periodic periodic boundaries on this mesh and also the inclusion of different types of pores or uh, voids, whether, uh, whether spherical or ellipsoidal. And you can also export this to Multimec as well. After you have your geometry and microstructure, the next logical step here is to define your constitutive material models. Starting off with the more simplistic models, we have elastic models. And the simplest of them all is linear elastic where we have isotropic or orthotropic material properties, which always have the same stress drain path on the loading and uh, unloading. For nonlinear elastic models, we also include materials that have bimodules, so a difference in tension versus compression, and also the ability to be strain stiffening or strain softening. But of course, they'll follow that path on the way back down to zero on the unloading. Moving on to the nonlinear models, we have plastic, plasticity models and continuum damage models. A few of the different plasticity models that we have are von Mises elastoplastic, von Mises elasto viscoplastic, and Drucker Prager elastoplastic. Elasto, uh, von Mises elastoplastic is more of the simplistic uh, plasticity model with general hardening. Uh, then we can add a rate dependence on it through the viscoplastic model. And Drucker Prager can perform some pressure sensitivity, which allows for changes of the model under compression and tension. Next, we move over to the softening side of things. Instead of hardening, damage models only allow for pure softening. So you have isotropic or orthotropic damage. So you can control how much damage is accumulated through asymmetric loadings, tension versus compression, or shear tension in the different shear components. You can control damage differently. And finally, to the more fun stuff, we have the failure and cracking, which is a huge topic in microstructural materials, composites, and basically all advanced materials. We have both cracking and failure capabilities. Through the crack capabilities, we have an automatic crack insertion algorithm that allows for cracks to be automatically inserted based off of their cracking laws. And we, with these cracking laws, we have elastic contact and also traction separation cohesive zones. So you can have different types of uh, separation, also different types of uh, traction parameters that can be controlled within your model or based off of any mode test you do on your material. 
We also have failure models, which allow for an instantaneous reduction of stiffness. And with both of these, we have stochastic capabilities where you can uh, apply a distribution. So within your model, you're gonna have some elements that might be weaker or stronger based off of a Weibull distribution. And this gives us a realistic approach of how material failures because they are in nature stochastic. So here on the left, we have the cracking capabilities where we have debonding that leads to, I'll play this one up again. We have debonding that leads to the cracks that propagate through the mesh. So our crack, cracking capabilities even work throughout a medium, not just two different material interfaces. And this is all performed automatically without having to insert any cohesive zones. Next, we have the stochastic failure where we have a general stochastic a law applied to all these different elements, you see how at some point we have enough failure accumulating in one random spot that leads to a complete failure throughout the whole part. Finally, we have the constitutive material model for viscoelastic models. And this is really important for composites, especially because when we start designing a material that has multiple materials and some that are continuous in different directions, we find that, for example, on a unidirectional, material that our longitudinal damping properties are very, very low because it's dominated by the fiber. And then we have the transverse damping properties, which is dominated by, dominated by the matrix, and that can lead to a highly damped type of layup. This is important because we need to characterize the matrix viscoelastic properties. And if we do that, we don't have to worry about the, the, the anisotropic viscoelastic properties. We can just apply the different orientations and not have to worry about extrapolating between the different directions. <clears throat> and now we'll go through what it looks like to run a multi-scale model within SimCenter 3D. So we have a materials engineering tab that allows for you to either create a new microstructure, edit or import an existing one. In this case, we're gonna import and edit this microstructure. Once you do this, it'll open up the multi-mech uh, legacy user interface. This interface will allow for you to create your microstructures, import different geometries for your microstructure, etc. <clears throat> and in this case, we have a microstructure that is just a porous type of microstructure that has a few different spherical pores throughout the structure. Once you create it, you can add the material to the library. And now when we navigate to the materials library, we have a multi mech specific material. And if we wanna use that multi mech specific material, all we have to do is select it and assign it to the certain region. So it behaves just like any other SimCenter material. So the ease of you know, assigning it to the microstructure is rather, rather straightforward. So before running a multi-scale analysis, you can define your loads, your boundary conditions, and you can also request some of the microstructure results. So let's say you have an interest in some different areas. You know there's a stress concentration in one area that you're gonna be uh, interested to see how it fails. You can request those different elements for output. You can also do this after you run the model. Uh, they won't have all the microstructures ready to be viewed, but we can do is you can perform a dehomogenization to get the same results. So once you're ready, you can launch a multi-scale solve. You can change the different parameters. You can run this uh, solution in parallel if you have many cores. And it'll run the solution and automatically be referencing the multi meg solver as it's doing the fully coupled multi-scale analysis with, in this case, Nastran as its global solver. Once it's done, you can post-process it just like any other model. They can also view the microstructures side by side. So you can look at things like, uh, how is my material failing? What components are failing? What's the stiffness of my RVE look like? You can view them side by side. You can load the model up. You can see how it's deforming uh, as your materials deform, which gives you very valuable insight into your materials. Next, we're going into the specific applications for aerospace composites. And we look at the life cycle of a new material within the aerospace industry. Uh, we don't necessarily fit in one area. Uh, that would be easy, but unfortunately our, our tool can fit in a lot of different areas along the development uh, process. 
uh, it starts all the way at new materials innovation when you're iterating through different designs, different new materials. Uh, this is popular with CMCs, looking at ceramic matrix composites. Uh, you're even looking at you know new, just barely theorized type of models. You can build them up in your microstructural modeling capabilities and run virtual tests to see how the performance is. Next, you have the material certification, which is a <clears throat> an initiative that is looking to completely virtualize the certification process. Because when you virtu uh, when you certify a new material, you usually put it through a very extensive uh, extensive certification uh, process that takes a lot of physical testing and can cost a lot of money. You also have efficiencies in performing large layup multi scaling. So if you have a very large part, instead of assigning every single ply within the large structure, which may not be possible with your machines, you can multi-scale and reduce the computation time. And then finally, you have all the other different types of complex laminate failures and like interlaminar failure with new different types of tougheners. And you also have material variation. Looking at a case study we performed with a ply validation, this is a unidirectional study where the RBEs are primarily aligned in the longitudinal direction, but we have some misalignment, which is generally seen in these type of materials. You have some waviness, which leaves a little bit of offset. So using that and a variation in the, the volume fraction of the material, we're naturally going to lead to a sort of stochastic run. And you can run this multiple times, as you see on the bottom, and you can diff different results. So you see how the stresses change as you load up. Then you have failure, you see you lose stiffness in different areas and we have the failed elements shown here, which when you lose you know, a, a primary chunk of fibers in a composite, that's usually the catalyst to lead to complete and total failure. So we see how we have, we have three different runs with different random seeds here. We change the distribution and the strength. We also, with this study, validated that our, our material is aligned with experimental values. Now we're looking more at the laminate strength validation. In this case, we took the standardized test, like a zero degree test, a 90 degree test, and a plus or minus 45 degree test. And we created RVEs based off that by about calculating the constitutive material properties. So you don't always need the constitutive material properties first. So you can work your way back to build out your nonlinear parameters. Looking at three different validation layups, quasi-isotropic and two other layups, we find that through using this RV based off of simplified tests, we can now validate our material and this would effectively replace the virtual certification process. Notice how the results are under 2% error, which is rather impressive. Moving on to more of the material innovation side of things. Ceramic matrix composites are a, a huge area of interest right now, especially for high temperature uh, applications. One of the issues though is the cracking and when you perform your uh, pyrolysis, uh, when you're done with it, you have these very high temperatures in which the cooling down might cause cracking debonding. Uh, and also when it's in service, you have high temperatures that can change the properties. So there's a study performed with DLR where we gauge the uh, we gauge the fiber matrix interface. And by changing that, we looked at the different uh, properties we would get when we change that. We can see how the cracks prog uh, progress differently when we have the different inter interfacial strengths. Looking more at the material variation side of things, we also have say draping with woven composites. A lot of times you're going to model your composite as an idealized uh, orthotropic material, but when you have shearing and weaves, really the material becomes anisotropic and you can have different shear and tensile and compression properties. So we see through this mapping, if you take a uh, either kinematic or a, a forming simulation, you can predict the shearing angle and then automatically map your microstructures to their different regions and they can get more accurate results on these stresses and failure. Another example of material variation and manufacturing induced variation is volume fraction and void distribution in continuous composites. If we look at a cross-sectional image, we see some areas have more volume fraction than the others, and some even have voids. So what you can do is you can break down the image in a grid or other different ways you'd like. 
and you can create a certain percentage of what different types of RBs are going to be, and you can distribute them randomly. And we distribute them randomly, that means you can run it over and over again and get different results due to the proximity of failure. Let me show a correlation here between experimental results and simulation results. Moving on to lattice design in additive manufacturing. Uh, and just to go over all the different topics in additive manufacturing, when you're printing out a part, whether it's metal, polymer, or even a composite, we have issues with things like morphology. We have different types of uh, different types of material based off of the laser path and the heating and cooling down. You also have things like surface roughness, which a lot of times require the polishing uh, of the surface, uh, but sometimes it's not possible. So you want to be able to gauge the effect of surface roughness on your part. You also have defects due to the printing process. And you have the actual design component, which are the lattices. In this scope today, I'll only be going over the last study, but in our next uh, webinar, I'll make sure to go over defects because we have a lot of work being performed in the area of defects in these materials. Now, what is the main reason for using multi-scaling for lattice design? If you want to model out a, a lattice structure based model, so right here we have a combustion transition a component for a gas turbine. We see how we have a lot of structures throughout the middle part of this component. If we model out with 3D elements, uh, we can get a pretty accurate result, but most likely that mesh is going to be way too heavy to run, uh, at, least if, at least on a normal computer. You could replace those with beam elements, but even though this is computationally feasible, we lose that accuracy with the beam assumptions. So multi-scale modeling allows for you to bulk, uh, bulk mesh this part, just like you would if it was a bulk material. So it's a coarser, smaller, or a coarser mesh. And instead of using a bulk material property for the inside, you can use a RVE to represent those elements. And that will give you the ability to represent your area with the material properties of a lattice, but you won't have to uh, mesh it out individually. So this basically gives you that big speed increase for multi-scale modeling. And looking at the general process of getting to that optimal lattice design, we start out with the bulk material properties, validate the lattice microstructure, run multi-scale models, and then iterate through the different lattices. So in this specific case, we're looking at Inconel 625 and we have a bulk material property here. And this is just a bulk printed material uh, of a dog bone being, uh, being uh, tested under a, a, uh, a standard tension test. And the goal here is to calibrate the initial bulk material properties and assign it to a a lattice type of microstructure and then run a virtual test to see how we correlate against a experimental test of lattices being a crushed as you see in the video. So in our validation, uh, just using the material parameters we calibrated from the bulk property, we see how our stress strain curve aligns very well with the experimental data. We see a couple of gaps in the, the yield point and a little bit over uh, a little over predicting on the uh, later down the strain percentage, but we think this can be alleviated if we run this in a multi-scale model uh, due to the kind of more complex strain distribution throughout the part. And through another study that we've done, we have a validation on, on the lattice. We want to now automate the optimization and design process of what is the best lattice. Uh, even with a simple BCC lattice, we have the potential to change the bar size and the aspect ratio. So through a simple study with a bracket shown, we're changing the design parameters of the bracket as well as the, the lattice property. And we can create a sort of trade-off in a Pareto front on those different parameters. So in order to minimize stress and minimize mass, we come up with this curve and we can have a design trade-off. So for a low mass design, we're going to have uh, maybe 
the, the thinner bars in the microstructure are different certain aspect ratio, so it's an increased stress and vice versa. We have a low stress design, which is the opposite. You can always come up with a compromise design that'll showcase the, uh, the, the trade-offs of the thing. You can have a very uh, you know, Goldilocks zone of a, of a design. And there's a lot of different ways you can look at this. And this is specifically through the HEED software that is a, a Siemens product that automates and hooks into uh, different tools like SimCenter 3D and automates this process and applies its uh, proprietary uh, optimization algorithm to it. So that concludes the session for today. Uh, however, before we go over to the questions and answers, I'm going to uh, show what the next topic is gonna be for our next webinar. And that's gonna be sometime in late July. We're gonna go over some more woven fiber composites. I showed a little bit today, but we'll be able to go into a little more detail on how we can uh, model these specific type of composites. We'll also be going through a short fiber injection molded workflow uh, which is a, a pretty extensive workflow of taking simulation of uh, mold filling models and taking those results and running a multi-scale model within SimCenter. We'll also go over composite pressure vessels, which are, you know, it's a very, uh, very important topic with the advent of hydrogen fuel cells. And we also have uh, more to show on additive manufacturing defects, as opposed to lattice design, we're looking more at the print and uh, defect uh, effects on a material. So thank you very much. I think we're gonna, Scott's gonna take it back over and uh, we'll, we'll start some of the questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Hayden. It was a very interesting presentation and a very interesting technology. Um, I know we probably only scratched the surface today of all that SimCenter 3D materials engineering can do. So if any of the participants have uh, questions, uh, feel free to contact us directly uh, after the webinar, or if you have time now, you can ask your question here. Uh, participants will need to uh, request to be unmuted, and then uh, we will unmute you so you can ask your question, or you can type it directly into the, into the chat box. Uh, but I did want to mention, as, as Hayden already uh, uh, mentioned, and as I mentioned on the first slide of the presentation, this is part one of a two-part series, and the second part is going to be presented at the end of July. Uh, we will do a bit of a refresher on some of the material you saw today, but we will be going into a different suite of industrial examples in the next webinar. But you certainly don't have to wait two months to get your questions answered. You can ask them right now and also follow up with me or Hayden after today's session, we'll be happy to, re to uh, reach out to you with answers to your questions. Perfect, and I can help uh, read in some of those questions that we're getting in through the chat. So again, um, encourage everyone to submit questions through the chat or through the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom um, window. But to start off with, um, how extensive is the material database in SimCenter 3D? Right, that's a great question. It's something that we've been actually working on. Uh, right now, we have our preliminary database and specifically the ones that we created for materials engineering is much more focused on composites, focusing on constitutive material properties. Uh, we find that this is often what is necessary uh, when you're designing a microstructural material. So we're starting to populate based off of our uh, publicly available uh, testing data versus our heuristics and rule of thumbs for designing, say, a carbon fiber you know, orthotropic material. Uh, we have these, are, are beginning to populate out. So we have most of the carbon fibers that are available. We have a few of the thermoset and thermoplastic material models. And our next uh, initiative is to really extend our polymer database to make sure we can capture the non-linearities there. Uh, however, this is an ever-growing uh, process uh, where we're trying to populate it out. So as of right now, our composite database is uh, just scratching the surface of composites. Now the database for SimCenter 3D for the bulk materials um, is, is pretty good. Uh, but as far as relating to materials engineering, uh, that's where we're at. But you can expect every release to have more and more materials with different uh, industries and applications. Say so Hayden, uh, what would a customer do if they were using um, the materials engineering software and 
there were no model for the particular material they had? How would they go about um, obtaining that information, perhaps from a test, for example, and getting it into the software? Right, and there's a few different ways. Uh, depending where you are on the supply chain, you're gonna have different uh, bits of material for your, uh, or different data sheets for your material. Some, some companies perform their testing in-house. So if you have a composite material, you might do all the traditional composite type of tests, whether that's the, the, the quasi-isotropic layups, the zero degree, the 90 degree, things like that. Uh, if you're a material manufacturer, you might and you probably will have the constitutive material properties. So single fiber tests or neat polymer tests, whether that's DMA test or uh, simple stress strain tests. Uh, both ways we can create a microstructure. We can start from the bottom up, like so for a material manufacturer example, we can just have our bulk materials and then we can just assign our material models after calibrating a material model to that. We can apply that to a microstructure and our microstructure is basically complete. For the other side, where you're farther down the supply chain and you have your composite tests, but you don't have constituent material properties, uh, it may be hard to find those constituent material properties because testing it is not very simple and uh, it's tend to not be released publicly by material manufacturers. So what we can do is this reverse engineering calibration that I uh, spoke of very briefly in the composite uh, verification step. What you could do is take your different tests and you can isolate the different parameters that define a certain stress strain test. For example, a zero degree test is going to have uh, dominance in the uh, the fiber properties and the zero degree fiber properties. You can slowly create your microstructure by isolating these different tests. So there's two routes. Uh, a lot of times we don't have too much issue and it all depends on how complex you want to get with your material. Uh, probably the most complex you want to going is viscoelastic with damage within your material models, which a lot of times is necessary for very vigorous, uh, very rigorous type of validations. So uh, we can get to those lengths, but you know, like you said, it's going to be, it'll take a little more testing to, to get there. Great. Thank you. Again, open to additional questions that you can submit in the chat. Um, Hayden, maybe the next one. Um, how does incorporating these multi-scale material models affect the, the simulation runtime? Like how long does it take to, to solve these models? Right, right. So I did show a benchmark of that, that gear running in 40 minutes. Uh, but as you can imagine, this changes depending on the model load case and microstructure. A general rule that we have is we try to keep our models, uh, even the larger ones, under a overnight run. So that's generally as long as you know, we want to see them. Uh, so it really depends on how efficient you can make your microstructure, your loading, and your, your global structure, because the bigger they are, the longer they take to run. We have a few other types of ways to speed it up. For example, I mentioned that you can run this type, of uh, this type of simulation in parallel. And it's a little different than the traditional FEA parallel analysis. With a, a large single scale model, if you run on multiple cores, uh, the, it'll actually split up the model into different sections and solve them independently in different cores and communicate that information. Uh, that does speed up your model, but it does have diminishing returns the more cores you have because there's a lot of information being passed between the cores. However, when you're running a multi-scale model, the only information we're passing from the global to local scale are a bunch of strain and stiffness tensors. So if you only have that, it's actually very efficient to distribute your mic microstructures across different uh, cores. So we see actually a very close to linear increase in speed for the number of cores that you have for quite a few cores. And there's no limitation on any cores you can use uh, depending on how large your machine is. Perfect, and, and possibly the last question, and then I'll uh, perhaps let Scott wrap up, um, but what sort of, you know, how complex can the load cases get while we're using these multi-scale models? Right, yeah, so uh, basically we, 
the, this this multi-scale approach is tied into uh, these these third-party solvers, and specifically uh, NASTRAN uh, with the Sim Center 3D, as well as we work with uh, SAMHSA, Abacus, and Antis as well within those environments within Sim Center 3D. And it's really as complex as you want to make it. So through FEA analysis, we have things like implicit analysis, uh, implicit. Um, we have implicit type of uh, dynamic models. Uh, we have explicit. We have uh, you know, basically thermal mechanical models. And we can primarily do all those different types of simulations. Uh, there are some limitations when you get into explicit modeling, because as you can imagine, if you have a shock wave propagating through a material, uh, it's possible, but with the reduced time step for a, a explicit run and the high strain gradients of a shock wave, it is not very efficient. So there are some analyses that are just more applicable than others. Uh, we can do a thermal mechanical analysis. Uh, our, our transient thermal uh, analysis capabilities are, are not complete yet within, within NASTRAN and uh, SimCenter 3D, uh, but that's on the, uh, the roadmap for uh, down the road. But we can do things like general heating up and cooling down coefficients of thermal expansions that are uh, homogenized, and we can look at things like warping in different types of materials, things like that. Uh, so you can go pretty complex. Uh, you know, there's, there are some areas on the cutting edge that may be inefficient or not possible yet, but we can pretty much handle most, F, uh, most of the FEA types of modeling capabilities. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Hayden, for the very interesting presentation and for answering our questions this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's uh, webinar sponsored by ATA Engineering and featuring Hayden Cornwell from Siemens Digital Industries Software. If you have any interest uh, in learning more about the uh, SimCenter 3D materials engineering software or other parts of SimCenter 3D or other Siemens software products, please do feel free to visit us at ata-plmsoftware.com. If you have some engineering problems that involve composite materials, uh, additive manufacturing or other uh, material science issues, we do have an expert staff here at ATA Engineering and would be happy to work with you on a services basis if you uh, are not in the position to do the work yourselves using this software. So we're going to close today's session and the recording, but again, the recording will be available in about a day's time. So if you wish to go back and review any part of today's presentation or share it with your colleagues, that will be available. Thank you for joining us.